street. Uh, Zane is going to be teaching for us. Uh, I'll be here, but Zane is going to be the teacher for next week. So please do uh, come out and, and learn some. He, I asked him what he was teaching on, and he said he had so much on his mind he hadn't decided yet. So I'm not exactly sure what we're going to be learning. But uh, So Zane will be teaching next week. And then the week after that, um, I kind of went back and forth on, on what to do, but I think um, I'd like to do a study on the concept of revival, uh, both in Scripture and historically and what it means theologically. Um, I'm going to use this book as kind of my framework. I'm not asking y'all to buy this book. This isn't going to be a book study in the sense that this has been where we discuss. I'm just going to use this as kind of my framework. And it'll, there will be back and forth in teaching, but it will be more me um, leading things uh, and teaching. So I'll use, this is When God Comes to Church uh, by Ray Ortland. if you do want to buy it and just have it so you can read it um, as we're, um, but, you know, I'm going to be using other sources and things too. But, um, so we're going to do that. I don't know if that'll be, if it'll be four weeks or if it'll be eight weeks. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I'll just kind of take it a week at a time. But I think uh, a study on revival sort of naturally follows after one on prayer. And uh, there's been some questions about revival, um, specifically that I've heard people ask uh, in our church, and just there's been a lot of talk about it. Um, I don't know if you all have heard what went on at Asbury Seminary in Kentucky. So there's just been a lot of stuff uh, that people have been talking about related to that concept. So I thought this would be a good time for it. And then... Uh, over the summer, I think uh, we're going to do uh, a series on the Minor Prophets uh, in the Old Testament, because that's probably somewhere that, that most of us don't spend much time studying, so that would be a good thing for us to do, I think. And then later on in the year, not exactly sure of the timing on this, we uh, will suggested that we do a study on other faiths, so other religions and so we'll do a couple weeks on um, Mormonism, a couple weeks on Jehovah's Witnesses, a couple weeks on Islam, and just what they believe, how it differs from us, how we can have conversations with folks from those faiths, and um, what's the, the, the best way to um, talk to them about the fundamental issues uh, of the gospel uh, and how it differs uh, from what they believe. So that's kind of the big picture plan of what we'll be doing for the rest of the year. Anybody have any questions or, or thoughts on any of that? All right. Well, I think uh, the best lead into tonight is just, I'm just going to read the first few paragraphs out of chapter 28. This is the best entry, entry point, I think, into our discussion. This is where he starts talking about systems because we're going to get into different systems of prayer. Um, namely prayer cards and prayer journals. That's going to be a lot of what we discussed tonight. But this is what he's, how he opens chapter 28. It says, When I do a prayer seminar, I ask for a show of hands of how many people keep their calendars electronically. Typically, one-third will raise their hands. Then I ask how many use a small pocket calendar, a wall calendar, or any other kind of written calendar. By that time, almost everyone, about 95%, has raised his or her hand. Only a couple of people are still stuck in the 19th century without a calendar. A few men use their wives as their calendars. Then I ask how many regularly use a written prayer system. Just a few hands go up, usually about 5%. When I ask why 95% write their schedules down, but only 5% write their prayer request, someone usually answers, if you forget an appointment, you pay for it. The obvious implication is, if you forget to pray, then you don't pay for it. If you don't do it, no one notices. My favorite response was, our calendar involves people. That's why we write it down. So prayer doesn't involve people. We're back to the influence of the Enlightenment on our modern world. Prayer is in the category of values and opinions. It doesn't connect with life. The bottom line is we don't write down our prayer requests because we don't take prayer seriously. We don't think it works. Then he goes into uh, some stuff about Paul and how... New Testament scholars think he must have had a prayer list because of all these different things that we know from the New Testament record that he was praying for. Things that were going on in these uh, different churches, the church at Corinth, you know, we read a lot about the sin issues there and his love for the, um, the, the church at Thessalonica and the, the Philippian church. So he tells them that he's praying for them constantly. So um, 
the implication is Paul must have had a prayer list. And so his point here is that we need some kind of system uh, to keep track with our prayers. But he does have a warning, and his warning is kind of at the end of chapter 28. And that's that we become kind of robotic and mindless uh, if we um, stick too closely to a system in the way that we pray. So he uses the example of the um, ACTS acronym, which I think is fine. Uh, but it does bring some, uh, some level of, of caution. I would, I would bring some level of caution of only praying in that way um, because it can become wooden and not very uh, heartfelt. So let me pause there. Anyone have any thoughts on just how he's opened this up uh, in chapter 28? Maybe the best way of asking is, do you guys use uh, some sort of written framework for how you pray? Uh, whether that's a prayer list uh, that, that always stays on paper or on an app or something, um, prayer cards or a prayer journal. Anyone? Yeah? Yeah, I think he's just trying to make the point that, all right, we think all these other things are so important that we got to have it on paper. If we really believe what we say we believe about prayer, why wouldn't we at least be writing it down and keeping track of it? But that's not to say that you can't care deeply about something. You hear, you know, a prayer request from somebody, and maybe you, you find some time to get alone right then, and you pray for that matter because you do care so much about it. But, of course, you haven't written it down. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to, like, you know, push what he's saying too far. I think he's just trying to make a general point. But, of course, there are exceptions, I mean, for sure. Um, so he, uh, he, at the end of, of that chapter, he says, uh, Remember, life is both holding hands and scrubbing floors. So... If we think about kind of how we connect this to prayer, the holding hands piece would be like kind of the stuff that he talked about in the earlier sections of the book the relational aspect of prayer, um, the childlike posture, and heart that we should bring to prayer. But then, so that's the, that's the holding hands, that's the, the more, um, what, how do I want to put this? Uh, yeah, who said that? Touchy-feely, yeah. But then, at some point, like, you just actually have to get down and get to work. Like, there's, you know, there's a practical side to it. So this, that's what this is. Um, the scrubbing floors is the, the practical tools and aids that will help you in prayer. And, of course, his examples that, that we're going to get into right now are uh, prayer cards and then uh, prayer journals. So... Does anyone in here use prayer cards? Anyone at all? We were going good for about two weeks. Two, two weeks? Uh, okay. We read the, uh, we still got some cards of the house. Why are you I'm speaking for myself. I was going really strong for about two weeks. Well, you did say we. Yeah. But um, it's just weird how easy it is to slip 
slip away from a good habit. I don't, you know, I don't know. But the good thing about be, it being written down is that even though you slip away from the habit, it's right there for you to go back and pick up. You know, so that's that's another I think one of the benefits. Um, anybody else have any experience with prayer cards? Okay, all right. So um, let's 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 try to let me let's first. Um, I want to make a point about why he includes a, a scripture verse. Maybe sometimes it's not even a whole verse. Sometimes it's just a phrase out of a verse. Um, why he includes that on each prayer card because it's important. He's going to get into this relationship between word and spirit. Some of us are word only, some of us are, are spirit only, kind of in the way that we uh, approach prayer. So I think it's important to note um, why the scripture uh, is so important for the prayer card. So in, there's a little discussion guide here. And in the discussion guide, it lists a number of scripture passages. And we're not going to go to all these passages, I just, I just want to... Um, put them here for us that all tell us something about the nature of Scripture or something that Scripture um, does, okay, that it accomplishes. So the first one being Psalm 119, 105, then Isaiah 55, 10, and 11, Romans 10, 17. Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen Ephesians six seventeen and eighteen and then lastly Hebrews four verse twelve. So I went and I just spent some time this afternoon looking through these passages. And what they ask you to do in the discussion guide says read the following scriptures, noting the phrases used to describe what the Word of God is or what the Word of God does. And I think you'll see how this, after I write the list of things that, that I just came up with after looking through these passages, uh, why these are so important, why Scripture is so important when we are praying for something or someone. Because Scripture is, first thing I wrote down is illuminating. It is informative. And so that could all that could be about God, about ourselves, or about we'll just say righteousness. It is specifically to Isaiah fifty five, it is powerful. So when I was reading through Romans 10, 17, I was really having a hard time thinking of the best way to word what that was communicating. And what I came up with uh, was that it has salvific content or faith building content. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It convicts. It corrects. Specific to 2 Timothy 3, it is useful. So that just shows the practical nature of Scripture in the Christian life. It reforms 
and it is sufficient for all of the Christian life. So now think through all of the different things that you could have to pray for, whether that is for your own heart or you're praying for, for someone else. Um, we could find passages if someone has a sin problem. We could, we could put a passage on their card that would have to do with convict, the Spirit convicting them of their sin. If someone is in, in doctrinal error, um, we know that Scripture brings, uh, it brings the true content of the gospel, the true content of God's law. Um, we could ask for... So if Scripture does all of these things, and Scripture, according to Ephesians 6, is the sword of the Spirit, then it is Scripture that the Spirit is going to use to work in someone's life. Does that make sense? The Spirit is going to use the Scripture to convict someone, to correct someone, to reform someone's heart. And it's sufficient to do all of these things. So, um, any thoughts here on this? Here? Uh, informative. So, just a general statement about how it tells us about God and who God is, about ourselves and um, how God's made us, why He has made us, um, and then righteousness. It gives us the content of God's law. Yeah. Um, let's see. So then he, all right, so he goes into how he uses the prayer cards. I think this is worth just saying out loud, even though most of us probably read it, but on 231, he gives guidelines, well, 231 and 232, guidelines I use when creating a prayer card. The card functions like a prayer snapshot of a person's life. When praying, I usually don't linger over a card for more than a few seconds. I just pick up one or two key areas and pray for them. I put the word to work by writing a scripture verse on the card that expresses my desire for that particular person or situation. The card doesn't change much. Maybe once a year I will add another line. These are just the ongoing areas in a person's life that I'm praying for. I usually don't write down answers. They are obvious to me since I see the card almost every day. I will sometimes date a prayer request by putting the month or year as in 8-7. So um, that's just practical stuff for how he, uh, how he uses the prayer card. And then you see an example there on page 233 of what one of his prayer cards looks like. So you see there's, for the one for Andrew, just scanning over it, I mean, I see two Bible, three Bible verses there. Psalm 51, Ephesians 4.2 and Romans 15, 7. So these are different things that were on his heart about his son, Andrew. Has everybody got this that needs it? Okay. So what I thought we could do is create a prayer card for our church. So the board here just... You know, imagine this is an index card, okay? So, we'd put the name at the top. All right. So, this is who our card is for. In this case, it's an entire congregation. So, you know, maybe the, the prayer requests here are going to be more general than they would be um, specific if we're praying for, you know, our spouse or, or one of our children. So what would be, if so, if we are a church, and what we know about what the nature of the church is, what the church believes, what the church is supposed to do, what, what would be a good candidate for, like, the main, like, key verse? And there's no wrong way to do this, really the main like key scripture passage that we want to have kind of at the top that we see every time that we pray for this church. Okay, well, that's what I had written down, so that's good. 
Um, I'm not going to write out the whole, um, the whole verse just because y'all don't want to wait on me to do that. Um, so we read this Sunday morning to open the service. I'll start in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain uh, to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So just in this passage, we have the command to baptize. We have the command to teach all that Christ, um, teach them to observe all that Christ has commanded. And then we have a promise that Jesus is going to be with. He's given this to the apostles, but then he says, to the end of the age. Well, we're still in the age right now, so this is by extension given to the church as well. So we have commands, we have a promise, so there's reassurances there. Um, and of course, since the church, uh, oh, already, where's my, my blue one? So we'll just kind of just block this off as kind of our main. So this is something that's really never going to change, okay? It's always going to be on our card for Harriet Baptist because we always want to keep this as, as the main thing, as our identity, right? All right, so what are some other things that we should be praying for for our church? You, you've been looking at my notes. All right, so I, I think we could put... Um, yeah, abound... In fruit of the Spirit. Then maybe in parentheses we can just put Galatians 5. What's something else? Okay. So for leadership, um, put Hebrews thirteen there. Love one another, so so we could put uh, we could put the great commandment. Matthew twenty two. What about uh, unity? That's something that we should be praying for. So maybe uh, mutual edification. Um, First Corinthians twelve. So for unity, you know, you could Ephesians four. Um, I mean, there's other passages, but let's see. I think that's a good list. What do y'all think? And these are timeless things that we should always be praying for. 
Um, so what is something... That, that we've maybe something we've been discussing as a church. Because I'm trying to just give an example of how he just put, he'll, he'll jot down just like one word um, that just just makes his mind think about something that, that he needs to be praying for in a, for a specific person or situation. So, uh, um, that we I, I mean I'm on, yeah we put that's not what I was thinking but. Um, Yeah, so, so, so for there, you know, we're, we're praying for, for safety, for fruit. And this is the kind of thing that may, you know, we might only be praying about this once or twice a year when the, when the mission trips are going on. But um, So what, what I was thinking about is, uh, you know, we, we've had conversations about space issues and, you know, do we need to, to look at, building more classroom space or sanctuary space. And this is something that, you know, the leadership's been, been thinking about um, and, you know, we've been talking through. So maybe we would just put, you know, build question mark. That's all we need to put, and that just reminds us to think, all right, I, this is something I need to be praying for. Um, maybe the Lord is calling us to, sit right here where we are, not do anything. Maybe he's calling us to, to build. Maybe he's just calling us to wait. You know, so, but that, that right there, just that one word uh, would jog our mind to, to make us continue to pray for that. So this is just an example of a prayer card. So I thought that would just be helpful to... And a lot of this is what I have on my... So I made some prayer cards the last couple of weeks. Um, and this is what I have on, on my prayer card for the church. Um, I mean, I have the fruit of the Spirit. I have the Great Commission. Um, I have unity. Um, so, so I have a lot of the same stuff. Now, that's making the card. Then he talks a lot about using the card. So I thought we could just spend a minute... And I'll just show you kind of how I've how I've put mine together. Um, so I have a stack of cards here, or a stack of bundles of cards. So, so I have a daily. This is like my label card. Like there's nothing actually on here. This is just to, to label the stack. So this is my daily bundle. So this is what I would pray through every day. Um, so this has you know, a card for my wife, a card for each one of my kids, a card for the church is in here, um, and then a card, the repentance card that he talks about um, later on. That's in my daily stack. And then I have, this is just the way my mind works on, on organizing stuff. So then I have, I have my Wednesday stack here. And then, you know, for every other day of the week. And so it may be a specific person uh, that I that I have a card for that's an extended family. I have one here that's like uh, health and suffering. So then that's going to change a lot because you know different people are, are going to be going through different things at different times. Um, and so on Wednesday, I had my daily stack and my Wednesday stack, and these are the two that I prayed for. Uh, on Monday, of course, I'll have my daily stack and my Monday stack. So um, that's just kind of how I've chosen to do it. Uh, because, again, that's just kind of how, how my mind works. So, anybody have any thoughts on using prayer cards? Do you think this is something that would be helpful for you, or, or no? Yeah, and so, so, but then, like, when an, when an email comes in and, and we need to pray for so-and-so who's in the hospital or something, that's something that I haven't figured out how to, to work into the card system other than that card that I have for, like, for health and for suffering. 
Um, but I haven't actually added any names to that card yet. I just have that card made because I just started doing this. Um, so right now I have a different list that I'm praying through that's like current, I don't want to call them, like current needs, you know, that, that are going on in the church. These are things that I'm going to be praying for from now until I don't know when, you know. Um, so I'm using these right now for more like long-term stuff than I am, okay, this is, a, this is a, a pressing need right now. You know, I just got an email, so-and-so's in the hospital. That's the kind of thing I'm stopping then and praying for that right away. Um, does that answer what you're saying? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think some of this just has a lot to do with the way we're wired. I mean, our prayer cards are going to work for some people. Journaling is going to work. Lists are going to work just, just for different. And some of us have gotten used to a system already, so I'm not saying you need to ditch what you're doing. and <laughs> That's not at all. These are just suggestions. Um, about the journaling thing, this would be a good time to, to dive into that. I do think one advantage of the journaling is Writing things down that way, it, it does maybe better capture the story aspect that he's talked about a lot because you can see the circumstances and everything changing um, as you go back and read through the journal or read through the list. And I think the list really kind of is the journal, um, even though he's writing things down other than requests. He's writing down, um, you know, God did this, answers to uh, prayers and, and things like that. But, um, yeah. Now that we, we list things, but we journal things, and then we, like you say, use journaling fluid to collect, and we go back and do the answers to the prayers and read it. Yeah. And, like, the two reflections, um, going back a year and saying, where was I at a year ago, and what was going on in my life, it, it, it puts together the story. Mm -hmm. so yeah. It gives me encouragement to sort of press on. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, so the point that, I, just to repeat part of that, um, she writes the requests in one color ink and then, and then goes back, and maybe, I don't know if it's, but you could write different kinds of requests in different colors of ink, and then the answers to prayer and then a different color, so that just kind of makes it easier for you to go back and, and capture the story when you're reading back through it. Um, anyone else have any, any thoughts on anything from, from chapters 28 through 34? I know that's a lot of pages, but um, I just want to make sure if y'all had something that you wanted to discuss out of this last chunk of reading that we did discuss it before we wrap up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? I did want to make note of on two forty. Well, the chapter starts in 241, prayer work, because he talks about working your prayers. So he uses Mark 4, 26 through 29, to kind of prove his point here. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and, rise, uh, he sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, he at once puts, uh, puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. So in this discussion guide that I have, it had a helpful little chart on how it contrasts the way that many of us pray as a last resort. So 
we want to work, so we attack this problem that we see. And of course, he's using the example of Bob in this section of the book. Uh, then we watch things fall apart. So work, watch, and then as a last resort, we pray. So work, watch, ask. But then he says we need to flip that to the order uh, that's given here in those verses that I just read. Ask, watch, and work. So prayer is first, and then watch to see what God is going to do, and then work. And that's where working the prayer comes in, where God oftentimes is going to involve us in what it is we're praying for. He talked about how God involved him in Bob's uh, life and how Bob was going through suffering. Um, and I think most of us have, have probably experienced this before. Um, we begin to pray about something and then uh, God weaves us into that story somehow. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't look the same every time. Uh, but, and, and also, when we use prayer as, as the first resort instead of, of the last resort, um, it's going to change our disposition and our posture toward that person that we're praying for. Um, this is something we've said before, but it's a whole lot order, harder to be bitter and angry at somebody that you're actively praying for. Um, and that's another reason why prayer uh, and asking God being the first thing rather than the last uh, is the route we should go. So I did want to just spend a second there. And the last thing that I wanted to mention was how he ends the book on 276. Kelly mentioned a moment ago um, the things on her prayer list that haven't been answered. Uh, other people in here have, have brought that up in weeks past. I think we all have things that we've been praying for maybe years, maybe decades, um, and we've not seen an answer. And he says um, on the last page, some stories aren't tied up until heaven. Because of Kim, Jill longs for heaven. This desire permeates her conversation. Jill doesn't say it's a beautiful day outside. She says this would be a good day for Jesus to come back. Everyone can see him. Jill wants to go home. Living in unfinished stories draws us into God's final act, the return of Jesus. While we wait for his return, it's easy to predict the pattern of the last days. The book of Revelation pictures a suffering church dying as creation itself is unraveling. Through suffering, God will finally make his church beautiful and reveal his glory. In the desert, you see his glory. In the last days, the bride will be made beautiful, pure, waiting for her lover. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And um, that's what prayer is going to boil down to uh, at the end of the day for a lot of us. <clears throat> we have our requests. We have the things that we, we continue to go back to ask for. Um, but at some point, in some cases, it just becomes that groaning and that longing uh, for him to come back, um, whether that's an acute season of suffering or just being disor disoriented and overwhelmed by how bad and how evil the world is. Um, it can be hard. So I think this, uh, the way he ended this was, was the right note. Um, that we're not at the final act yet, um, that Christ will return and make all things new. Uh, that's the context of our prayers, um, that there is an ultimate hope. So that's all that I have. Um, anybody in here have closing thoughts? Anything you learned from this study that you would like to bring up one more time or anything of that nature? Did anyone learn anything? Please say yes. <clears throat> um, well, this has been good for my heart. Uh, I can say that for sure. Um, I've been, I was, this was the second time I read this book, uh, and I was, I'm, I'm glad we did this. Uh, and I think, like I said in the opening, this is going to be a pretty natural transition into talking about revival, because I think that's something that the church is desperate for right now. Um, we know we need it, and I don't mean we just Harriet Baptist. I mean, Harriet Baptist does too. I mean, we just kind of the, the Western, the American church uh, in general. Um, so we pray to that end. Um, 
the last Sunday of every month at 5 o'clock. We always gather here to pray for revival and awakening, so um, please join us. I will close us in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Father, each one of us, uh, we're all going through something different. We all know someone uh, who's going through something perhaps totally different. Uh, but one thing that we all have in common uh, is that we live in a fallen world and uh, it affects us in many, many different ways. And Lord, we long for the return of Christ. And sometimes we, I know that I, I stop to pray and I can only get one or two words in before I'm really just kind of uh, at a loss for words and I'm thankful that your spirit um, does help us in prayer when we don't know what to say, that your spirit is assisting us. Lord, you tell us that in your word. Lord, we're grateful for that. I thank you for each one of my brothers and sisters uh, that we have each other uh, to edify one another, to encourage one another as we do wait uh, for the return of King Jesus. Lord, help us to be a gospel-minded church, a loving church, uh, until he does return uh, to bring us home. And we pray this in his name. Amen.